In an earlier episode, we discussed five best practices for DevOps, but there's more to it than that. If you want to succeed at DevOps and so at software development, because let's be clear, the data says that teams that practice DevOps and continuous delivery produce better software faster, then we must take the ideas of DevOps and continuous delivery seriously. So that what are the other best practices that the data says make DevOps work? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Please do hit subscribe and the, hit the bell notification icon if you'd like to stay informed of uh, new episodes. Previously, we talked about five things that were highly correlated with successful teams and so successful software businesses. Test automation, deployment automation, trunk-based development, shifting left on security and other practices, and loosely coupled architecture. In this episode, I want to explore a further six ideas that can help us to achieve these high value outcomes that are correlated with continuous delivery and DevOps. Uh, if we want to be able to regularly, repeatably, and sustainably deliver software to our users, then these are the practices that we need to, take, that we need to undertake. As I said last time, I call this focus on effective delivery, continuous delivery, but others, perhaps most people, call it DevOps. Whatever you call it, it's the, currently the state of the art for software development. If you'd like to learn more about this state of the art approach, please do consider joining my email list. There's uh, links in the description below. Uh, here we will discuss ideas related to continuous delivery in DevOps and often periodically uh, we'll offer how to, useful how-to guides uh, like uh, this one on how to assess your continuous delivery and DevOps capability. Back to the topic in discussion today though. Here are six more best practices for DevOps. First, empowered teams. Can you change your technology or design without asking permission from somebody else outside of the team? This is primarily about organizational and developmental decoupling. Clearly, this is more efficient if you don't need to consult with others before making, making, making a decision. Uh, the trick is to be able to do that safely. There are two broad strategies. I kind of touched on these in the last video a little bit, but we can choose to decompose the system into independently deployable modules. Uh, each of the team, each team is responsible for one or a small collection of these modules, and so is in charge of its own choices, its own designs, and the deployability of the system. We evaluate these things together, we build them together, and we test them together. The team needs to be composed of people who are uh, in a position to be able to make these decisions that, that, that they need to. They need to take the responsibility for the software that they're looking after and they're empowered to do so. The architecture of the system is compartmentalized to allow teams to change their part of the system without having any impact at all on uh, other teams uh, or other parts of the system. There's an alternative though. We can decompose teams into independent functional units. We can take a shared code ownership model. We can allow anyone to make a change anywhere in the code base. It's one code base, one deployment pipeline, one scope of evaluation. And then we can protect the whole thing with great automated tests so it's safe to make changes, even in the areas of the code that you're a little less familiar with. Both of these are workable uh, options and allow us to uh, make progress safely and, uh, and allow the teams a, a, degree, a high degree of autonomy and choices within their own scope of work. Next on my list, continuous integration. Can we safely commit small changes multiple times per day? For that, we need fast, high quality feedback on our changes to get the best picture of our progress. We're going to create deployment pipelines that are efficient and are going to give us feedback in a matter of minutes. I generally recommend for the commit stage, the continuous integration stage, that we're looking for feedback in under five minutes with a high level of confidence that our changes are good if all of the tests at that stage pass. 
This also brings in the necessity for, for dis a disciplined approach, and I spoke a little bit about that in another episode, which I'll link uh, up here. Next in my list of behaviours that, that predict a good outcome in terms of DevOps performance, software development performance in general, version control. It may seem weird to be talking about the need for version control. Nearly everybody uses version control to some degree. But I did come across an organisation only two years ago that wasn't using version control. So if you're not yet using version control, catch up to the 1980s, start using version control and your life will be better, I promise. But I'm talking about this in a broader context. Could we reliably deploy a working version of our system to a test environment from any point in its history. Version control is more than just source control. Taking version control seriously leads to infrastructure as code. This is a vital step in stabilising our ability to achieve repeatability and reliability in our release process. Continuous testing is next on my list. Uncommit are all tests automatically run to the point that we can achieve a releasable outcome. To really control the variables in our approach, we must automate all regression testing. We want to test everything and so will apply a comprehensive approach to testing. Testing is not somebody else's responsibility. It's a cornerstone, in fact, the driving force for development in this, in this approach. So, we place automated test-driven development front and centre in our development process and we drive all development activities based on these automated tests at some level. Fifth in my list, monitoring and observability. Can we determine when our system has problems without waiting for users to complain? Measurement is important. Without it, we are only ever making guesses, really. If we want to get the benefits of a stronger engineering-driven approach, we need to take measurement very seriously, and we need to take the measurements. We do that in the form of tests in other, in, and other things in the rest of our development process, but once we go into production, we now need to think about that too, and how we're going to gather measurements from production. Is our software working properly? Is it delivering the value to our customers that we hoped that it would? Did our, did our changes deliver any impact? Do we need to add capacity? Are we running out of disk space or, or, or CPU cycles or memory in our systems? All of these things are measurements that we should be actively gathering and monitoring all of the time. It will be nice to know all of these things and collect the data to make them visible as part of our normal working processes so that we can understand where we need to add work to stay on top of those sorts of issues and also steer our products in the directions that are going to please our users more. Last in my list of six things, data change management. Do we include the changes to data and data structures as part of our continuous delivery process and pipelines? In a philosophical sense, continuous delivery and DevOps and science really is based on the assumption that we may be and probably are wrong. Our ideas are going to be tested. We're not just going to trust our guesses. We work to check our ideas in ways that allow us to recover fairly easily if we are wrong. As we learn more, we like to be able to change our minds about the data structures and the stores that we use for our data in production. Um, how will we change them? How will we migrate the data? How will we update those structures and stores? Uh, and we need to build that into our development processes, practices and testing approach. I covered this in more detail in this video up here, which you can take a look at if you're interested in that. We'd also want our automated tests to be fast, efficient and deterministic. We want our tests to be isolated and self-contained. We'd like to be able to uh, run the tests in parallel 
uh, with, with other tests and we like to run the same test repeatedly and in all of those cases we'd like to get deterministic consistent results. That means that we need to take the data for our tests seriously too. We need to think about ideas like test isolation uh, to be able to ensure that, we, we, that one test does not leak information into another test and so destabilize it. If you can do all of these six things and the five others that we spoke about in the earlier video, you're doing well. Um, the data predicts that if you are doing well with all of these things, then you will be creating better software faster. You'll be having more fun and more commercial success while you're doing this. Thank you very much for watching.